This is Epicenter, episode 384, with guests Robert and Colton from Liquidity Protocol. So we're on today with Robert, who is the CEO and founder of Liquidity, and Colton, who is the head of growth at Liquidity. Uh, here to t- talk today about their uh, very interesting new lending protocol that they're building on Ethereum. And we're going to be diving deep into a lot of the mechanism design and sort of the reasons for why they, you know, there's a lot of lending protocols already today and why they felt the need that like, hey, this is going to bring something really new to the table. Uh, but before we dive into that, this is actually a very special episode as well, because uh, we have a brand new co-host joining us this time, uh, Zubin Koticha. He is he's been on the show twice already. You know, talking about Open V one and then another uh, the more recent episode just last week with Open V two. Um, and you know, we just had him on, and I, I've known Zubin for a long time, and we've had him on, and he's just been you know always really interesting and great at a lot of this stuff. And so we just, you know, we wanted to bring him on as a co-host. So I just want to give Zubin a chance, a quick second to just intro himself as well to all the listeners. Hey, hey guys, I'm Zubin. Thanks so much for that, uh, for that intro, Sonny. So Sonny and I go way back, actually. We went to college together and then right after college, we were living together in SF. Uh, and it was just like this crypto house, which is, it was just like the best time uh, ever. I always knew Sonny as the podcast guy because he would always wake up really early in the morning and be like, guys, be silent. I have a podcast. But some of the really cool kind of moments with some of the top minds in the space have come out with that, uh, out of that that process. And it's been so cool to see. Um, and so I was, you know, really excited to, to join. As for me, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Open, which is a decentralized options protocol in Ethereum. Um, and we are kind of currently allowing people to trade call and put options uh, on Ethereum. And the goal is to allow for Ethereum and all sorts of ERC-20s in the long run uh, and build the first highly liquid options market in, in, in DeFi. Um, but you know, I've, I have two Epicenter episodes talking about that more in depth. Uh, for now, uh, happy to tone it, turn it back to Sonny and, and be chatting with uh, Robert and Colton. Awesome. Thanks. And so, yeah, guys, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is your guys' background? How did you guys get involved with the space? How did you guys start working together? And what led you to Liquidity? Yeah. Hi, everyone. And, and thanks for having uh, us on the show. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So yeah, let me like tell you a bit about my background first. So I'm Robert Lauko. I'm a Swiss uh, resident. I um, used to grow up in, or used to grow up in the Crypto Valley, uh, which has become famous over time. Um, but then later on, I um, like moved to Zurich. That's where I'm based now. And I, I'm a lawyer by profession actually, but I always had a keen interest on technology and computer science in particular. And um, while working as a lawyer, I just realized that uh, when blockchain became a thing, and it was even a thing in my hometown, that it's really like something I wanted to dive in. And uh, I just started doing my own research. Uh, and after a while, I, I was lucky to get in touch with people from Definity, which was a small company back then, but it uh, led me to my first job, basically, in, in the blockchain space. And I became the first employee in Switzerland. I had a chance to work on their protocol as a researcher, but also help with operations. And yeah, and, and while working there, I also realized that I got more and more interested in the DeFi space, which, which was starting to unfold in the ecosystem around Ethereum. It was mainly a compound and a maker uh, back then in 2018. And then early 19, I, I started to like think about like how I would do things differently and maybe like more efficiently than Maker uh, when it comes to borrowing um, crypto assets. And that's how the idea came about. And uh, yeah, in, in November 2019, I left Definity to fully focus on my own project, Liquidity, which is all about borrowing. And yeah, I mean, we set up the company and later, like maybe Colton can tell a bit more about how he joined uh, as a head of growth. 
Yeah, so my sort of crypto journey is like really long and windy, so I'll spare a lot of the details. But like, long story short, I was kind of the weird kid in like 2014 in college talking about Bitcoin, uh, this new magic internet thing that people didn't really understand at the time. Um, And then I ended up graduating in 2018, so that wasn't like you know the best time to work in the space. Uh, But after graduating in 2018, I was like, okay, crypto is, is slowing down quite a bit uh, just because of the, the chaos that happened in 2017. Uh, I'll, I'll go work in my other my, uh, industry that I'm also passionate about, which is esports. I spent about a year there, uh, mostly as a graphic designer, motion graphics designer, a video editor, content producer. Um, and then after that, I wanted to make my way back into crypto um, and ended up com- coming across a position at the Stellar Development Foundation where I spent about two years uh, working on community and ecosystem development. And then I I wanted to make my way back into Ethereum and through a mutual connection, I was introduced to Robert and Liquidy. Uh, We ended up hitting it off. We had a lot of good conversations. And after a couple months, I ended up joining the team, uh, which was like three months ago now. So it's been full steam ahead ever since then. Awesome. Um, And so, yeah, so Robert, like what, led you to want to build liquidity so you know you mentioned you were you got interested in DeFi because you saw a lot of these like existing you know you mentioned compound uh so you know there are a number of existing lending protocols and such on ethereum you have compound you have ave you have ones that output a stable coin like maker uh what 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 was the sort of weaknesses that you saw with some of the existing systems that led you to want to design a new one so uh, I was looking mainly at the way those systems liquidate positions that become under collateralized because those loans, they, are, they all need to be sufficiently collateralized. And I just realized that speed, it's all about speed. The faster you are able to like sell off or, or somehow make sure that your position gets bailed out in case of uh, an under collateralization, uh, the lower you can set your collateralization ratio or the, the the less extra margin you need for the same like system security and and then like i started like thinking how how to make this just more uh, efficient and quicker like than an auction for example or on the other hand i mean you can also just sell off collateral at a discount i mean that's what like the early version, like the first version, the single collateral die was doing. But even with that, I mean, you lose some portion of your collateral due to the fact that you need to sell it at a discount. And that's like how, yeah, I came to the conclusion that why not like make it so that instead of start, instead of like starting looking for a buyer or a bidder, once your position becomes underwater, you can like, uh start earlier and have something around like an insurance or stability pool as we call it where people can already become guarantors of borrowers that may need to be liquidated in the future so you don't need to find somebody because you already have them available in your system and that's yeah how the idea came uh about cool um so what do you see as kind of the fatal flaw of like um, the liquidating systems of that, that exist, do you see it as like a contributing factor in black Thursday? And you saw that as important uh, uh, to fix. Um, Could you sum up liquidity as like really uh, doing liquidations better or is is there kind of um, a broader design choice that you seem to keep making that, that makes it different? Yeah, so it's definitely, I think, the like the initial uh, idea that like led me to start designing it. But it's uh, by, by far not the only like thing that separates us from those other systems. Like there are other aspects regarding how we achieve uh, price stability, but also the fact how we deal with governance or the fact that we don't have like uh, voting or governance uh, mechanism in our system. But yeah, I mean, the initial like improvement was all about uh, making liquidations more efficient. It's interesting because why is this like a last, this fast liquidation is very important. And, and this is interesting to me because I think it's been a while. It's maybe been like six months or so, but we had UMA protocol on uh, about six months ago. And they were actually taking the opposite take where they were saying, hey, 
these liquidations don't need to be that fast. And like Maker is actually liquidating too quickly. We want to actually have a slower system for like providing Oracle data that triggers liquidation. So what do you see as the benefit of these fast liquidations versus what they're saying, which is like, hey, if the price is crashing very quickly, something's going bad, we want to like take it slow and steady rather than like force liquidating as soon as possible and people are buying a, a, a depreciating asset. Yeah, I think the main underlying issue is that you need to make sure at least uh, if you want to keep your currency stable, um, is that you want to make sure that your debt can always be covered, like fully covered. Now, I mean, there is some extra margin there because, I mean, those systems, they are over-collateralized. But if yeah, it takes some time to liquidate your position, like from the moment on when you trigger this process, like an auction that may take up to six hours or longer, then during those six hours, the price can, of course, drop even more. Or And, and to account for those um, further price drops during uh, like the time it takes to liquidate the position, uh, you need to like, have a higher margin in the first place. So if you expect like a maximum price drop during the six hours time span of like let's say twenty percent, you need to add those twenty percent to the like margin that you already wanted to have in the first place. So, and of course by adding more like margin or by requiring a higher collateralization, you make the loans less capital efficient. Yeah, I think there's a lot of questions we'd like to dive into there. But before, let, let's actually let's zoom out for one second and make sure uh, we give all the listeners a good idea of what the liquidity protocol is in the first place. And can, can you describe the protocol at a high level first? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, there are like three main um, differentiating factors. Like we talked about like Maker DAO as our main competitor, but Liquid is a bit different. I mean, our main focus is about borrowing. We want to make borrowing as attractive as possible by doing basically two things. By first of all, um, requiring less collateralization, like the minimum collateralization ratio is only 110%, which is I think the lowest on the market you can find. Then the other um, differentiating factor or benefit is that we are not charging a recurring fee or interest rate. We do charge like one-off fees, but that's like a bit different because it's more predictable for the user than a variable interest rate. And then last but not least, we have this kind of uh, very like ex extreme or radical um, decentralization and non-governance approach where we like, don't really have a governance mechanism. Everything is immutable and we also uh, have like an incentivization mechanism uh, which allows us to um, not be like required as a company to run um, a front end or a web interface because we have like incentivized third parties um, that will run those front ends which allow people to access the protocol. So those are the three main um, points I would like stress here. Yeah, you mentioned uh, something really interesting, right? Uh, kind of a motivating force is making borrowing as attractive as possible. Would you describe that as uh, one of the main goals of, of, uh, of the protocol uh, to make borrowing as attractive as possible? And then what steps do you think you guys do differently if that is one of the main goals um, that will make liquidity much more attractive than some of the existing alternatives. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the two main points I already mentioned them briefly, like are like a lower minimum collateralization ratio, which not only like allows you to have a higher like security as a borrower for the same, like say, collateralization as you would have on a different or another system, but it also allows you to be, be become more risk-seeking if you want to um, and do leverage. So you can achieve a much higher leverage up to 11% or 11, sorry, 11x um, by going up, by maxing out your, your possibilities in our system. And that's like more than what you could do on, on a similar uh, protocol. And then the other thing is interest rate, which is like maybe less obvious, but the problem with those interest rates is that once you have a position open, you may have opened it at the time and the interest rate was low, but now uh, you have a debt and, and the interest rate increases and that's what 
just currently happens on, on like in our competitors uh, system like maker and then you you feel obliged or you have this kind of pressure or uneasy feeling as a borrower to repay your debt earlier than you wanted and by replacing like a recurring fee by something which is one off which is an upfront fee when you take out your loan you have this kind of nice feeling that you wouldn't be obliged to pay anything later. So you can keep your debt or position open as long as you want. Yeah, and I, and I want to add on top of that is like floating interest rates have become this sort of norm in DeFi and they're not a great deal for borrowers, especially if those interest rates are floating upwards. So a lot of the times you take out debt and you're expecting to uh, somehow maximize your profit by using that debt or using that leverage. And it's a lot harder to do that if you don't know your cost to borrow or if your cost to borrow is constantly fluctuating. So let's say you, you're, you're intending to borrow for a year and the interest rate changes constantly over the course of that year. It's a lot harder for you to quantify um, the outcomes that you'll be able to get from that leverage. And so knowing your cost to borrow up front gives you a lot of advantages. Could you explain a little bit about, how, you know, how do you get this collateral ratio to be much lower? So you have this 110% collateralization ratio. I mean, obviously, the lower the collateralization ratio, the higher risk the uh, someone the system faces, both an individual CDP holder, but also just the uh, system as a whole faces. And so what enables you to get this lower rate compared to things like Maker at 150%? Or like, you know, I think some of the other protocols have like even higher, like synthetics goes all the way up to like 750% or things like that. So yes, it's, it's really the fact that we can um, trigger liquidations instantaneously without a need to find anyone to bail out the borrower. So by having a stability pool, which I can maybe briefly explain, so it's you can think of it as an insurance pool where people can um, put their LUSD tokens. LUSD is the name of our uh, native stablecoin or token. So any holder of LUSD can place those tokens in that pool anytime, also withdraw them basically at any time. But then when the system needs to liquidate a borrower, which uh, like drop below the 110% threshold, then all the system needs to do is basically take out an amount of tokens from the stability pool which corresponds to the debt uh, that is about to be liquidated and then basically just burn those uh, LUSD tokens and pay off the debt. And in return, what it also does is that it takes um, the ether, like the collateral held by the borrower's position, and it gives it to uh, the pool. Now, the pool will obviously be filled uh, or by will be filled up by not just one, but like many people. So um, everything happens like pro rata, like everybody who deposited a share um, would get, like we would lose um, some LUSD in case of liquidation uh, in proportion to his deposit, the share, but also gain Ether collateral from the liquidated borrower um, in proportion to the deposited uh, share. That's the idea. So if I'm understanding this correct, what's happening is there's a stability pool which allows people to deposit LUSD, and it's basically saying that they get first rights access to being the liquidator of choice of the protocol. So instead of people having instead of having an auction process where people are competing for to be the one to liquidate a CDP, it's saying, hey, you know, the protocol has this preferred liquidator, which is the, this uh, stability pool itself. So what what's the benefit of this? Like, is it to reduce the competition or, I mean, so on one hand, you say it's about speed. Isn't this actually a scary for the um, people who deposit in the stability pool as well? Because when you have this like liquidators who participate in auction, if ETH is flash crashing, you know, they want to actually, or if they think it's going to drop further, they might want to withhold putting in a bid in the auction. But the stability pool is kind of forced to buy ETH. And even if it's expected that ETH is going to continue to crash, right? So, so that's right. There are risks involved um, if you become like a stability depositor. But we chose this like 110% uh, by looking at like the past data also of like not just the ether price but the ether price that we can get from chainlink which is our oracle and and we just saw that um this 10% margin is about the maximum that 
could happen or based on the historic data that like could be like the maximum price change between two like price feed updates. So theoretically, if you as a stability depositor, you're running like say a, an automation tool that would fire sale or sell like the ether that you get from the liquidated position like immediately uh, when you get it, then um, you should be able to um, recoup your like loss in the worst case. But I mean, that's just the worst case. In normal situations, liquidations would happen just slightly below 110%, maybe at 109 or 108. So there's still this 8 or 9% net gain, um, which should uh, compensate for like the risk of a loss in, let's say, in a black swan event. You achieve this much faster liquidation mechanism through the stability pool. And it allows for much more capital efficiency, uh, a rate of 110%. So doesn't there still need to be an on-chain transaction to uh, start a liquidation? Uh, how do you kind of incentivize that on-chain transaction? And how do you ensure that on-chain transaction gets into the mempool and gets into a block uh, sufficiently quickly uh, as well? Yeah. So. Um... What's pretty cool about liquidations is that anybody can execute them externally. Um, so basically, we have what's called a liquidation reserve, which basically is um, it's almost like a fee, but it's a fee that you get back if you pay to pay back your debt. So, for example, you open a trove, you put aside 200 LUSD or 200 LUSDs added to your debt, uh, but that's kind of like stuck in your trove as this um, reserve for a liquidator whenever they actually execute a liquidation. So, the other part of that is a 0.5% um, of the collateral also goes to the liquidator. So, if I'm somebody who's running a bot who likes to execute liquidations, Anytime I liquidate a trove, I receive 0.5% of that trove's collateral, along with 200 LUSD um, as a sort of flat rate. Uh, but what's also cool about liquidity is that you can liquidate troves in bulk. Um, and because of the way it's implemented, you'll actually save money on gas by doing that. So let's say there's 30 troves eligible for liquidation. It'll actually probably be more profitable for you to liquidate all 30 in one transaction versus um, trying to liquidate just five of them or something like that. Uh, so that's that's kind of the way it's designed uh, for liquidators um, who who might be running bots or you know monitoring the troves. So this is super cool because it's for a stablecoin platform pretty revolutionary to have instant instant liquidations. Um, but for a lending platform like Compound, uh, you already have instant liquidations. How would you compare uh, liquidity? to something like Compound for instantaneous liquidations? I'll add that I'm, I'm not totally familiar with the Compound liquidation mechanism. Um, I'm mostly familiar with uh, Maker's liquidation mechanism because um, I've been kind of just studying it in a little bit of detail as well as their 2.0 liquidation mechanism that they're working on. Um, but I don't know, Robert, if you have any anything to add regarding Compound. Yeah, so I think Compound's liquidation works by like letting people like repay just a fraction or like the part um, that needs to be repaid in order to um, push the collateralization ratio back to a healthy um, range. So it's like a partial liquidation in a sense, not like a complete um, liquidation, if I'm not mistaken. But um, the difference is, I mean, they still like have higher liquidation ratios than, than we do. And so as far as I know. And uh, um, the other difference is, of course, like the interest rate that uh, like with Compound is again, like a recurring fee. And in our case, it's a one-off um, issuance or borrowing fee, uh, which like leads to a different like experience as a borrower. Got it, got it. So it's that combination of um, both instantaneous liquidations and this new way of doing like flat fees for a borrow uh, that's unique and, and kind of uh, uncharted territory to a certain extent. Yeah, exactly. And another thing though that I saw that was uh, was a bit different about liquidity is that in Maker, die holders don't have any claim on collateral or at least until there's a liquidation uh, and they can buy that. But like, it seems in liquidity, an LUSD holder, which is the stable coin, which maybe we should have mentioned that earlier, but yeah, LUSD is the stable coin in liquidity. They can, at any time, you can redeem your 
uh, even if you're not a CDP holder, you can redeem for collateral. And how, so how do you do that? Who gets, whose collateral are they redeeming here? If, are, is all the pl- collateral getting pulled together or are, do people still have individual CDPs or troves? And so then who gets liquidated? Yeah. So people do have individual troves, uh, but what's really cool about redemptions is this, that it's this mechanism almost for uh, like bringing back or bringing debt back into the system and then canceling that debt out. And so the way it works is whenever the, the system stores troves in this way that um, it's from the most risky to the least risky or from the lowest collateralization ratio to the highest collateralization ratio. So when somebody comes along and it's profitable to redeem that LUSD, say there's this arbitrage opportunity, LUSD is floating below the peg, they can redeem that LUSD uh, at face value against the riskiest trove or set of troves in the system. So that redeemed LUSD is actually used to pay off the debt of the riskiest troves within the system in return for their collateral. So as a as a borrower, you don't incur a net loss. You just lose a little bit of your exposure exposure in return for your debt being paid off. That's basically allows for people to feel more certain that LUSD is actually you know redeemable instantaneously for its value. Um, and how do you kind of ensure that these redemptions are um, kind of in good faith and in, are not arbitrages? So, for example, let's say that um, LUSD is actually trading at $1 on other markets, secondary markets, but the Chainlink Oracle, uh, there's a little bit of lag. You know, it's not instantaneous. And so ETH might be trading at a price uh, that implies like you can uh, make money by doing an instantaneous redemption, right? So um, is there some kind of fee or how do you ensure that that is, is accounted for, that or potential for Oracle lag? Yeah, so that's a great question. That's a point that we have looked into because it is uh, like a potential like issue that, that we need to take care of. And the way we do that is that we have a redemption fee and the redemption fee, even though it has a decaying mechanism, which means that uh, it goes up with every redemption, and whenever there are no redemptions, it would slowly decay or exponentially decay over time. But there is like a minimum fee at 0.5%, which makes sure that it can never decay below 0.5. And 0.5% also happens to be like uh, the, the minimum threshold for the chaining oracle in order to trigger um, a new price update. Um, so of course there can be like maybe like situations with like where the Oracle is a bit lagging behind, even though there is this 0.5% threshold, but it can happen that there is like a higher price uh, hike. So it, it means that an arbitrager would have this kind of uh, um, possibility if the price goes up faster in reality than the Oracle keeps track of. And in that case, yes, there can be temporary situations where an arbitrage could make maybe small, some small profits, but it's not something that is there every time. And it, it would be, uh, it, it already requires quite some sophistication and also like the fact that the fee would already react and it has this kind of memory that it stays high and it goes down. It's not just that it goes up for a second and then it's back to zero or 0. 0.5. Yeah, and I'll also add that default minimum fee also makes it slightly more expensive than Uniswap whenever, you know, the LUSC ETH Uniswap pair fee. So like by default, you'd get a bad deal if you just made that trade because you'd be pay more in fees by, you know, redeeming against the system if it wasn't profitable to do so. Yeah, this lowest collateral debt uh, trove that's, you know, being uh, redeemed against, is there any chance that this reduces the collateral ratio or will it always increase their collateral ratio? So it should always increase the collateral ratio because you are basically taking, like you're subtracting the same constant amount both from the debt and from um, like the collateral. And, and given that the collateral is higher than the debt, I mean, this would lead to um, an increase of the collateralization ratio. I mean, if it was a different, it, it would be different if the debt was higher than the collateral, 
which means that the liquidation mechanism somehow wasn't able to liquidate it uh, fast enough, but that shouldn't happen already because there are very strong incentives to liquidate earlier. And also we, we are not allowing to redeem from troves that are below 110%. So those troves would be eligible for liquidation, but not for redemption. So this should never happen. I think we can rule that out. And I, I think that's actually a good point because there was an example the other day that I was working on where uh, there was a trove that I redeemed against uh, that was right on the border of 110%. So it was really close to being liquidated. And that redemption saved that trove from liquidation, which is a 10% haircut, right? Like losing your ETH exposure is probably better than just losing 10% of your entire position. So in the event that you get redeemed against, in some cases, it's probably a good thing because that redeemer could have just saved you from, from losing 10% of your whole position. Another uh, mechanism I came across was you guys have this thing called a recovery mode, which is basically triggered when the overall collateralization system of the entire uh, me system is below 150%. And so can you, can you describe to us a little bit about how this uh, recovery, what, how this whole recovery mode scheme works? So, yeah, I mean, it's um, relatively sophisticated because we have to um, think in, in different like cases, but generally like it is triggered when the total collateralization ratio of the system drops below 150%, like all the collaterals value summed up divided by all the debt value summed up, that's the total collateralization ratio. So that would trigger uh, recovery mode. And then what happens is that now every uh, trove or position becomes eligible for liquidation if its own individual collateralization ratio is below the total collateralization ratio, which by definition is below 150%, because that's what triggers recovery mode. Um, so that sounds scary, of course, because now suddenly people with, let's say, only 110, uh, sorry, one on, with, even with 140% uh, collateralization ratio could be uh, liquidated, but we do cap the liquidation loss. So you would never lose more than 10% of your collateral, or like you never lose more than uh, this 10% difference between your collateral and debt. So it's basically for you the same as you, as in a case where you're liquidated uh, below 110% because you only lose this 10% um, above your debt. So it's, we, we cap this uh, loss and we give um, a way to the user or to the borrower to get the surplus refunded. So let's say if you were liquidated at 140%, um, you would basically get back 30, um, 30 of your collateral. Like you had a debt of 100, you had collateral worth 140, and you lose 110 of your collateral and you get back 30. So that's uh, the way it works, like the main mechanism. Is there an attack here, though, that can be done where, like, let's say I wanted to grief someone and they had, let's say they had 120% or something, and I'm a giant whale, could I like add in a bunch of liquidity at like 140% just in order, so much just to push the global ratio below 150% just to cause a liquidation of the person below me? Um, that's not possible because we uh, prohibit every transaction that would trigger recovery mode. Like every borrower operation that would uh, drop or decrease the total collateralization ratio below the 150% threshold would be um, banned. And also we have a set of bans and, and prohibitions during recovery mode. Like we make it so that some operations are not allowed during recovery mode as well as at the cusp of it to make sure that those incentives cannot be easily like abused. Yeah, so that whale would have to be very mean and dump the entire ETH price, not just to try to attack liquidity. They'd have to, they'd have to aggressively <laughs> dump right, ETH right. too. So another thing that uh, was, was interesting here, so it seems like there are a few risks that will in practice push the a vault to not be at like a vault or sorry, a trove opener to not be around 110%. So the first thing is like you could get uh, redeemed upon. Um, so you lose your, you know, ETH position and then you might have to, you know, repay your, your flat fee in order to open it again. 
The second is kind of this mechanism we just talked about, which is recovery mode, uh, where the lowest collateralized vaults uh, will, will be in the liquidation state. Um, and then, of course, there's just traditional liquidation. If you, for some reason, go below 110%, you're also uh, in a little bit of a risk scenario. There is another mechanism, I believe, right? So if the entire stability pool, uh, well, actually, would love to hear you guys describe it. What happens if uh, the stability pool runs out of funds uh, and there needs to be liquidations beyond that amount? Whenever the stability pool is empty or emptied during um, a liquidation, then what happens is that we basically take uh, the position that needs to be liquidated and uh, chop it up uh, in proportion to all the other borrowers in the system. Like you just look at their collateral, like you have a set of borrowers with their own collateral amounts. And what we do is we basically split up the liquidated borrower's position, both the collateral and uh, his debt, and uh, just give those tiny proportional shares to all the other borrowers. Like every borrower would see a slight increase of his own collateral, but also an increase of his own debt. And given the fact that uh, we do liquidations just slightly, or in normal situations slightly, below 110%, it means that uh, when you look at the total um, net uh, change, it's like a gain and not a loss because you, you get more collateral value than you get debt from a liquidated borrower. So that's how the system basically ensures that debt can always be redistributed. We call it redistribution. And of course, the collateral is redistributed um, according to the same principle. Got it. So if there are multiple different uh, vaults or tropes, sorry, uh, that are in a liquidation zone, right, and the stability pool has kind of been exhausted, how do you choose uh, or which part of these troves go to different troves that are not under collateralized? Does that make sense? I think I understand your question, but the general idea here is that every... Um trove gets redistributed to every other trove in the system. Like it's an, an, a one-to-all mapping, um, so to say. Now, the, maybe the, you're also wondering about the order of liquidating uh, like multiple troves which are below the uh, threshold. So there we don't like, we initially wanted to like impose like a strict ordering, but then realized that this wouldn't work um, because an attacker could then clog the system with a huge amount of tiny troves. So that's why we had to relax like this liquidation ordering, which we initially wanted to have, which would have been like that you can only start liquidating the position or at the like trove that uh, like has the lowest collateralization of all troves. Now we, we relaxed it so everybody can be liquidated below the 110%. Uh, and you can also apply this batch liquidation that Colton just explained um, to make it more efficient. But then everybody would be on the recipient side. If you are near the uh, liquidation ratio, the even though you are, let's say you happen to be at like 111% and you had more debt applied to you, yes, you, you ended up on top because you have more collateral, but like you, you could have been added at a rate that actually pushes you below the liquidation ratio. And isn't that actually, couldn't that cause like cascading liquidations? Yeah, that's a very good point. So we did some simulations and also just some static uh, like uh, calculations. So how that would uh, play out, and we realized that it it only really matters or it only puts you in a position where you, as a recipient, can all, all like where you as a recipient would also become eligible for liquidation only if you are already very close. Like as you said, maybe a, a one eleven. Uh, that would be a, like a range or like collateralization ratio where it could happen that you would uh, become liquidatable just uh, due to the fact that you receive those uh, liquidated shares. But for higher collateralized troves, that wouldn't really happen. It's uh, very unlikely if you just look at the numbers. Yeah, and I think even if you're on that 111% threshold, you're so close that um, 
if a lot of people are getting liquidated and we're in a phase where we're doing redistribution, I mean, the odds that ETH drops 1% in that scenario is probably really high. So you'd almost like end up being in a, in a liquidatable position regardless of, of whether you got the redistribution or not because of ETH's volatility. And so I think what Zubin's question was is how much, like what, how do you decide the distribution of, you know, you're, you're distributing both this debt and collateral to existing uh, trove holders, how do you decide like how much of it goes to which person? I mean, I, I assume it can't be per trove because otherwise then I just open a lot of troves just to earn a lot of money that way. Yeah, so the way it works is that it just looks at the collateral amounts held by all the recipients, like by every um, active uh, trove owner, and it would just... Um, give you like a proportional share in proportion to your collateral um, as a percentage of the total collateral in the system. Like somebody, let's say, who has a, a collateral worth $2,000 and another person who has like collateral worth $1,000, now the, the, like the trove owner with the $2,000 would get like twice uh, the share of the debt, but also of the collateral. Like it's really proportional to your own collateral. Does it make sense? It, there's almost like two tranches. So, so when it, when it comes to like earning from liquidations, right? There's like two tranches, right? There's the people who provide in the stability pool first, and then if that gets depleted, then it goes to existing trove holders. Is there a world in which like no one wants to deposit to the stability pool, and everyone would rather just use their capital to provide CD to open more troves and like? As long as they can like get other people to not put into the stability pool, it ends up the stability pool never ends up being used, and it only becomes like this like that second layer tranche becomes the primary system. So I think as long as the price of one LUSD is below one at one ten, like which is a hard price floor. Uh, sorry, which is a hard price ceiling. I can explain it later, but as long as the price is below the one ten dollars. Uh, it would mean that basically every liquidation would lead to a net gain for uh, the stability pool providers or the stability providers. So um, just looking at the incentives, it, it's not really conceivable that nobody would want to become a stability depositor because you can there is free money basically on the table. It's only like conceivable if the price exceeds 110 because then... Um, uh, like this kind of net gain for you as a stability depositor is uh, turned into a net loss. But this is a very extreme scenario which we don't expect to happen exactly because we have this uh, kind of hard price boundary at 110. So isn't there also additional rewards, I think you might have mentioned, where you get uh, liquidity tokens, LQTY, liquidity tokens for being in the stability pool? Could you uh, explain about that? That seems very, very interesting. Yeah, so LQTY is the sort of secondary uh, token of the system. It is not a governance token, uh, but it is a token that allows its holders to sort of have a claim on fees in the system. So uh, as you're earning LQTY for being a stability pool depositor, you can then turn around and stake those LQTY tokens in order to earn fees that are accrued uh, from people who are borrowing from the system and then people who are redeeming for this, from the system. So those fees end up going to the staking contract and are distributed amongst the stakers. Uh, so this is really interesting. This is almost like... Uh, the opposite of the paradigm that's existing right now. Right now, we have lots of governance tokens, which don't really get cash flows, at least at this point. But this is uh, this is almost more like a, a token that does get cash flows, but not governance rights. Yeah, and the reason there's no governance rights is because there's nothing nothing to govern. So basically, um, everything within Liquidity is handled algorithmically from monetary policies to everything else. So there, there's nothing to govern, which is like kind of a blessing for some, you know, like governance, pro governance processes can just be long and boring. And frankly, they could suck. Um, and a lot of people don't enjoy them. Um, and, it, and a lot of that also has to do with the culture you've built around uh, your governance and stuff. But for the most part, governance can be a really hard problem to solve for. So if you can come up with a solution where 
you don't need governance and you don't need a community of people pretending they're the Federal Reserve or something like that, uh, you end up in a pretty good spot. So that's kind of our, our opinion when it comes to that. How do you do protocol upgrades without a governance token? Have you thought about, uh, you know, liquidity V2? How, how do you work on those kinds of protocol upgrades? Yeah, I think our current headspace is that it'll be very similar to Uniswap's approach where uh, they deploy the system in an immutable way. And if we end up doing a V2 later or maybe a V3 after that, whatever, uh, we come up with um, one, a migration plan, and then two, uh, we end up launching a completely separate system. Um, Almost similar in nature to what Maker did when they went from single collateral die to multi collateral die, or what Uniswap did from V1 to V2 and then eventually V3. Does the liquidity token act as, you know, in Maker, the other purpose of the MKR token is also act as this like global backstop kind of thing. Does the liquidity token take on any such role in this system or not really? No, it does not. What I'm kind of seeing that what, what Liquidity is doing is that in Maker, it's sort of every CDP is sort of this like standalone unit. And they, there's no sense that there's all these things are actually sharing a protocol. But what's happening in Liquidity is it's like, hey, we're kind of taking the assumption that because some people are more conservative with their like collateralization ratio, some people are want to maintain 300% ratios or something like that, that's they're they're allowing enabling some people to take on more risky ratios um and it has this sort of somewhat socialization of risk a little bit but then shouldn't the people who are taking on those higher collateralization ratios be compensated for that because like so so currently you're saying that like the liquidation liquidations are getting given pro rata. So once the stability pool is out, it's getting given pro rata based off of collateralization amount. Shouldn't there be some sort of weight given as well to the collateralization ratio, where if you have a higher ratio, you should be getting rewarded slightly higher than people with a, even if someone has a higher amount, collateral amount, but lower ratio than you? So, uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, point, which we also looked a bit into. So, I mean, that would mean we would, have like a super proportional or yeah, not sure what the right word is, like share of the liquidation gains if the stability pool is empty. Um, now the problem with that is we have we are bound to some like implementation details around um, like keeping the troves in an ordered list because like it was quite tricky to do all this in a scalable manner. Like implementation was not easy as I can tell you because exactly due to the fact because the troves are so interrelated and interdependent rather than just being standalone um, beings. Um, and, and for that matter, I mean, it, it was just, it's not possible to um, do any kind of redistribution that leads to a reordering, like that may breaks the ordered list because some troves would then um, suddenly like get like a higher or lower collateralization ratio than their neighbors in the list. And it turned out that like the way we do the redistribution is more or less the only way. It's not the only way, but it, it seems to be like there's only a very thin design space that allows you to redistribute debt and collateral in an order-preserving way. One thing I wanted to ask about, um, shifting gears a little bit, you had mentioned that LUSD uh, has a price ceiling of $1.10. Uh, it seemed like that was one of the the weaknesses of uh, of Maker in a liquidity crunch is that Dai can be trading far above its peg. Um, you mentioned that you have like a hard ceiling. How do you kind of create that that mechanism? Yeah, so it's basically a simple um, arbitrage cycle that becomes possible uh, thanks to the one hundred ten percent collateralization ratio because. When the price of one USD eh, of one LUSD is above uh, 110, then you can basically take out the maximum amount of debt that you can uh, get from the system against your Ether collateral and sell uh, the LUSD on the market for a price uh, that's higher than basically the value of your collateral. 
So you can theoretically even forget about your collector because it doesn't matter for you whether your trove gets liquidated or not because you already made uh, a profitable um, transaction just by opening a maximum uh, collect or um, a lowest collateralized trove and selling uh, your LUSD. Right. Aren't there the flat uh, issuance fees that we talked about earlier, though, that would make it effectively higher than $1.10? So that's right. So it's basically there is this zero point five percent in uh, like like because we cap it at zero point five percent as a minimum. But whenever there is a situation where this happens, then we can be more or less sure that um, the fee would be around this zero point five percent because uh, like the way we set the fees or the way that the protocol like sets the fees is by uh, measuring the amount of redemptions or the redemption volumes. And redemptions only make sense if the price is below $1. So nobody would redeem if the price is above 110 So that means that the, the fee would eventually or relatively quickly go back to 0.5%, uh, which, as you like uh, correctly mentioned, would mean that the price sailing is not exactly at 110 but at 1105 as also with the price uh, floor there, we also have the redemption fee, which makes it a little bit fluffy. So we have like both sailings and uh, floors are they are like a bit not clear lines, I would say. I, I guess that we should talk then a little bit about how this like uh, these fees are decided. And so, you know, as you mentioned, this is meant to be governance minimized. This is done purely algorithmically. Um, can you talk a little bit about how about this algorithm? How how is this done, and like, how do you uh, have a purely algorithmic like input into what the price of LUSD is? So um, the the main uh, way is that we can measure like the redemption volumes, uh, and by volume I mean the volume uh, in proportion to the total uh, supply. Like the total LUSD supply uh, can be set uh, in relation to the redeemed amount or the redeemed amount in relation to the total LUSD supply. And then based on this fraction, uh, we can determine like the amount by which the fee needs to be increased. Like we have a base rate, which serves as the base this for both the sorry do you mean like over like a, a over a window like you're saying like oh in the last 24 hours this is what percentage has been redeemed or what do you what do you mean by uh, fraction so actually yeah so actually it it like every single redemption uh is like affects like some percentage of the total LUSD supply now what we do is we take the current base rate and we add basically uh, the redeemed fraction of the total supply times 0 0.5, which is a constant parameter, we add this to um, the current base rate. So let's say the base rate is at 1%, and now somebody redeems 2% of the total LUSD supply, then we, we, we calculate 0 0.5 times 2, which is 1, we add 1 to 1, which gives us like a 2 as the new fee. Like, and then it would decay over time. How long is this window for decaying? Yeah, so for the decaying, we, we just uh, set like a half-life uh, of eight hours. Um, but we are still like tweaking the parameters. So um, that's something we are still finalizing. But I would say it would, this one will stay uh, probably at eight hours. So it would just go down by 50% by eight, in eight hours. Why use this sort of indirect calculation of like, you know, trying to estimate whether what LUSD is trading at instead of just using a Oracle, like, you know, using Uniswap TWAP, or if you're already using Chainlink for like your ETH price, why not just have it also tell you what LUSD is trading at? So this is also a bit like a chicken and egg problem. If you want to use an external Oracle for something that you are just issuing or creating, because I mean, Chainlink doesn't have come with like an LUSD Oracle, um, in the first place, so you first need to have some kind of token that gets large enough uh, to be like have a large enough market cap in order to be sufficiently traded so that you can uh, get like a reliable price from like Uniswap or or an off-chain Oracle. 
So we think that by measuring our own like transactions or the redemptions, we can basically just use what we already have as a signal. We don't need to rely on something where there is just less liquidity. Because, I mean, if only 5% of the LUSD supply is, let's say, in a Uniswap pool, then it's much easier to manipulate that price because you only need to manipulate a fraction of this 5% than in our system, which basically measures redemptions as a percentage of the total LUSD supply. So we, we should have a much higher um, resilience against manipulation if we use our own numbers. Zubin had a interesting uh, attack that he was thinking about, which is, can you hold like the whoever has the lowest collateral ratio? Can you hold them hostage by like threatening to redeem against them? And like, if they want to regain their ETH exposure, then they have to go keep adding back in ETH and have to keep paying that issuance uh, base fee. And so, is this like an issue? Maybe Zubin, maybe you want to explain the attack better than I did. <laughs> uh, so it's not necessarily an attack. It was like, can what I was wondering is like, there are some kind of, for being the lowest uh, vault or trove, there are some kind of stresses that you put against the system that you should have to pay for. So I'm wondering like economically, if there are ways for the system to extract that from you. So for example... Um, anyone could redeem against like a very low collateralized vault, um, which is good for system health, but is bad, very likely bad for that, uh, that individual because that individual wants that ETH exposure. And so in order to get that ETH exposure, they're going to have to pay an issu issuance fee again, right? So basically, they don't want to pay the issuance fee, so they would pay up to the issuance fee to a uh, to a contract which like threatened to um, redeem against them if they didn't pay uh, like this 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 floating rate that was like a that was like a, a weird thing that I was thinking about does that make sense uh, I can like reiterate what exactly that means so yeah I'm not a hundred percent sure but maybe I mean like the idea here is that you should always be like exposed to redemption risk if you are the lowest trove and the price is below $1 minus the redemption fee. So that's like a situation where the system, where like it's the feature, not a bug that redemptions would happen because that's what we want. We want to like reduce the total currency supply by um, burning LUSD and by making it maybe costly to reopen a new position because we don't want people to just being redeemed against and then immediately reopen the same position because that would be a zero-sum game. So in, in those scenarios, we want that. Now, I'm not quite sure whether you're referring to a situation where the price is above $1 or maybe exactly at $1 and now somebody wants to do harm to some uh, uh, trove owner at the lower end of the scale. Yeah, so, so there's a few things there. I think like one thing that was interesting that you mentioned, um, it seems like a big motivating factor for liquidity is for in order to allow uh, much lower collateralization ratios. Um, but at the same time, it seems like if you're at 111%, 115%, 120%, um, there are all these things in place to, uh, for example, redemption, the, this mechanics we just discussed, to discourage you from being that uh, that like least collateralized or being near 110 percent, what do you think is like an effective rate, right? That uh, people should aim for then, right? Because it seems like you know at 111 percent, 112 percent, we want people to get redeemed upon because it increases the health of the system. What is the rate then that you see as like truly healthy for the system? To a certain extent. Yes, so I think here we we looked a bit at the numbers from like our competitors and we saw that like let's say the maker system normally hovers around 300% collateralization or at least the single collateral die had this kind of uh, average. Now with multi-collateral it's like really it depends on the collateral type so it's hard to compare but for Ether I think 300% 
on the maker system is not just an average, but it's also something which is relatively safe. Now, in our case, we don't need that much because we have this faster liquidation. But what you can see there is that the 300% is basically twice the minimum, like it's two times the 150% minimum. So in our case, that would translate to 220%, which is uh, two times 110. So I think 220 would be like the lower end of where we would consider our system to be safe, but we would generally recommend or hope that it would probably hover around 250%, so over time. But people are crazy these days, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell. Yeah, that's super interesting, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting point. Uh, I just think it's an interesting point that, I mean, you really get um, more leverage for the same amount of safety because of the 110% minimum. So um, that's the important fact to consider. You definitely don't want to be hanging out around 110% just because it exists. But if you're a maker user who is used to a 300% collateralization ratio, you can transfer over and, you know, hang around 250%, 220% and take advantage of better capital efficiency that way. Right. And it seems like there's a trade-off there. You get a better liquidation uh, ratio that makes you feel comfortable as an individual to not get uh, liquidated. But you also have uh, these other kind of variables to think about, redemptions, etc. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see the dynamic between like Maker and Trove and, and Trove's uh, on, on liquidity and see what kind of market forms between people shifting back and forth. Do you think this will become like a much harder or higher mental overhead for like people trying to open positions on liquidity? Because, you know, in Maker, I just have to think about the only thing I have to be thinking about really is the ETH price. But now here in liquidity, it seems that there's like all these different things I have to start like paying attention to. I have to pay attention to, you know, how many people are redeeming LUSD. I have to look at, you know, what is the over the global collateral like ratio. I have to start paying attention to what is this like stability pool rate because, you know, things in the system act differently. Like this is so much more I have to be paying attention to. And do you think this is a higher, cogn this is going to, this cognitive overhead is going to cause UX issues? It's possible, but I also think, you know, users are starting to become more advanced, so they want more advanced access to leverage. Um, I, I think we've done a pretty good job in explaining how liquidity works, like within our documentation, explaining how it works within the UIs we've made available. And I think people are, um, I think people are going to get the hang of it. You know, like, like all new things, um, they come with headaches sometimes, sometimes they don't. Um, and it just depends, like, are people willing to sacrifice um, capital efficiency for maybe like one one or two more things they have to consider, right? And I even think, um, I'm not totally convinced that redemption risk is like this massive risk that people will have to be thinking about all of the time, uh, because it only comes into play within certain situations. And, you know, I would rather be protected in those situations anyway. Um, so I, I don't think it's something that will be just constantly prodding in the back of their head uh, as soon as they kind of get the hang of the system. And maybe one thing I would add to it is that um, we can also think of the market in of the like the borrowing market in segments. So for those who are willing to um, be on the safer side, like maybe have a position that's less capital efficient, um, those people only need to maintain um, a collateralization ratio above 150%, which is what they are used to from like using like Ether A on Maker. So they don't really have to worry about anything else because it's practically impossible that they would get redeemed against. And even if the system enters recovery mode, they would be on the safe side. It only affects like those risk seeking people who are already like um, maybe more DGEN or more. Um, yeah, just trying their their luck. So I think those people, they folks, they they will need to be a bit more cautious or a bit more attentive to those changes. But I mean, there are also trove automation tools that we encourage uh, people to build for our system, and uh, and at some point we we assume that this will all be automated. Like at least uh, like the sophisticated borrowers would use those kind of toolings. Carlton, I heard you mention the UIs. Uh, so I, I noticed throughout a lot of your docs, you guys talk a lot about uh, 
like you know incentivize front ends and things like this so uh what why like you know I, I know like a lot of people care about like you know decentralized front ends like you know Uniswap has a number of front ends and things like this but like you guys seem to put a lot of stress on it so why is this such an important focus for you guys i mean one of them is philosophical um the big one of the cornerstones of liquidity is decentralization um, and immutability. And so one of the best ways to achieve that is not only at the protocol level, but at the front end level too, right? Like if you have one access point to your entire protocol and somebody shuts it down or you have like a DNS hijacking or something, you never know what happens these days. All of a sudden you put all of your users at risk. And the other side of it is we're starting to see the market evolve such that Interfaces like Zerion and Zapper and Argent are starting to become more popular than the interfaces of the protocols that they're plugging into. So these like third party front ends are becoming a sort of staple in the industry. And we think that one, those are important, but two, it's also important to incentivize those. And not many people have really given that a try. Uh, we're kind of the one of the first ones, I think Yearn is starting to experiment with it a little bit. Um, I know ZeroX tried it way back in the day, but the incentive mechanism was uh, maybe not completely fleshed out at the time. Uh, so th I think that's one of the big reasons we want to focus on it is because one, we can maximize decentralization, not only at the protocol level, but the sort of product level where you, people actually access the protocol. Uh, but two, we can find a way to incentivize uh, this new like sort of budding segment of, of the crypto industry. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Um, so how does that mechanism work? How, is it like a DAO that's giving uh, liquidity LQTY tokens? From my understanding, it's not. It's actually built into the, the protocol. Yeah, it, it is actually built in. So we have this uh, basically pool of LQTY rewards that is going out to stability pool providers. Um, how that works for front ends is that whenever they facilitate a stability pool deposit, um, through their front end, they tag it with an Ethereum address that's associated with their front end, um, and it tracks the rewards of the users that they uh, sort of bring in to the system. And it also applies another thing called a kickback rate, which specifies how the rewards are split between the users and the front end who facilitated that user's deposit. So let's say I have a kickback rate of 80%. I'm a front end. You guys all deposit through my front end. Um, I'll receive 20% of the rewards that you guys earn over the course of, of your participation in the stability pool. And so that's distributed straight to my Ethereum address as, um, as my users earn those rewards. Got it. Would you expect to see kind of front ends competing for, for rates? Yeah, exactly. We expect to see um, the sort of kickback rate to be a competitive market, but also the features you offer your users to be a competitive market. So two things to, to touch on really quickly. We provide a front end launch kit, which is basically this cookie cutter uh, template that anybody can deploy just from the command line. It comes with built in features and stuff. Uh, but we also provide a front end SDK for more um, maybe advanced products who want to integrate liquidity into their existing system. And so those two types of um, ways to, to build a front end will also have a competitive advantage. So if you're launching the cookie cutter uh, thing that we provide and you try to say, like, I want all the rewards, I don't think anybody is going to be excited to use your front end. But if you provide a custom integration, maybe with some custom tools, then people are going to be more willing to accept, you know, some kickback rate that uh, is a little more favorable to the front end. Uh, so we expect those two aspects of it to be an interesting competitive market. Another thing I kind of wanted to ask, um, especially for you, Colton, was what is the growth strategy, right? There's there's so many moving parts in making a stablecoin platform to be highly liquid. Uh, and there's so many moving parts for also the borrowing aspect. And, and you have also a stability pool on top of that uh, and LQTY uh, as well. How do you bootstrap all of these different parts of the protocol? Um, and, and make this a really liquid experience for users? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's something we think about a lot too, because I think, you know, it's really interesting. The state of the industry now is that you kind of launch this governance token and you expect like a community to just pop up around it. And it's kind of like, the, it's like low hanging fruit um, a lot of the time these days. And so since we don't have that approach, uh, we really have to focus on building these like paths to success for all of these different users within the ecosystem. And so what I've really been focused on is building 
this sort of foundation for a community to grow, um, whether you're a borrower, an arbitrageur, a staker, a front end, like you need all of these different resources to actually succeed. And so that's where a lot of our focus has been. Uh, we think that the front end reward scheme will help a lot on the adoption front, but also on the user acquisition front. And as far as liquidity goes, um, we plan on um, providing some LQ2I rewards to an LUSD ETH Uniswap pool uh, to help bootstrap liquidity for the first six weeks. Um, and then from there, we want to uh, pursue ecosystem integrations outside of that um, that we think will be beneficial for uh, the growth of the ecosystem. So, you know, like curve integrations, maybe shell protocol, et cetera. There's a, a bunch we've been considering and looking at um, and more pop up each day. So that that's where we've been looking first, focusing internally and making sure we have everything set up and ready to go for launch, for a community to grow and thrive and focus on uh, things besides governance so they can kind of succeed within the ecosystem. And then we want to start pursuing integrations as best we can um, in ways that benefit liquidity. One thing I also wanted to ask was kind of uh, how you think about the regulatory question and especially having a, a token LQTY, which will get cash flows. How are you thinking about these kinds of questions and, and creating a decentralized protocol as well in the different regulatory regimes that exist? Yeah, that's also an important point for us. And uh, I think you are um, referring here, or you may be referring to like US securities laws, security laws, um, because like there it could matter whether you are issuing a token that has some like reward capture mechanism or not. But I think here we are taking a little bit of a different approach. So what we are really trying to do is making sure that the token is sufficiently decentralized and not just the token, but also the whole system and including the front ends so that it doesn't really matter what your token is because the entire protocol is so decentralized that there is nobody who is like really an issuer. I think that's, um, like the point. Now, I, I know there are like systems which have like this opinion that, oh, they are just giving out a, a governance token and that's not a security and, and that's it. And they are like somewhat more centralized because they have their own front end and they, they maybe they even have like majority voting rights or at least like a, a large uh, impact on, on the votes uh, through their like own tokens. But I think that's, yeah, that's also a dangerous strategy because, I mean, a governance token can easily be turned into something that gives you a cash flow. And at, and I think that's like eventually the goal. I mean, we've seen it with Uniswap that they now have like, or even in version two, they have some kind of mechanism for um, diverting some income to um, the token holders, like the Uni token holders. So I think our approach is really about decentralization, which we think is um, the way to minimize legal risks. And then one other question kind of around this, how, how did you kind of bootstrap uh, your team and uh, how do you like fund development, uh, especially without a DAO that can give, uh, you know, give uh, rewards to, to developers? So, I mean, we are mostly VC funded. Um, so that means we we had a few uh, two um, like rounds uh, of financing, which uh, gives us um, a nice runway, so that we can also like see what we want to build in the future. But uh, currently, we are really focused on just uh, releasing and launching this uh, liquidity protocol, and and yeah, I mean we are now not that much worried about like fundraising anymore or at least for the time being. Yeah, and, and it helps that we're we're quite a small team. There's about eight of us. So it's not like we're having to, to fund like, you know, 20 plus developers or anything like that. We're pretty scrappy. And so what's the uh, roadmap here? So, you know, are you, you guys aren't launched yet, but should be coming soon, I believe, right? So I think this week. <laughs> Okay, um, so if it comes out after today, I guess uh, we could share that the official launch date is April 5th, uh, which we haven't shared, which we plan to share uh, actually shortly after we finish recording this. So that'll go out um, today. The roadmap so far has been wrapping everything up. We were able to uh, fit in another audit in March. Um, I, th I think it was three weeks with Coinspect. And then after that, uh, the plan is to uh, ship it and make it go live. So... 
And so where can uh, people learn more and connect with the, and, you know, uh, do you have like some community channels that you want to suggest or where can people just go to learn more about the information and launch and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, definitely. The best place is liquidy.org. And then we also have docs.liquidy.org, which we think is quite extensive for mostly a, a, an FAQ. And then we also have technical documentation that you could find through that FAQ. Uh, so anything you want to learn about liquidity, you could do so through there. Hopefully, if not, anybody feel free to reach out and ask questions and we'll get them added. Uh, we also have a community discord, which is relatively active. Um, we also have a, a Chinese speaking telegram group that is quite active as well. So if you're international in that way, uh, feel free to participate there. Um, and then Twitter, we're at liquidity protocol, I believe. So th those are the main, main sources, probably more to come. Uh, but other than that, those are the best ways to keep up. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on and sharing what you guys are building and really excited to see it come a lot, come live in the next couple of weeks. Likewise, appreciate it. It's great to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.